Hello. Um, thank you all for joining us. We're very excited um, about today's conversation um, with uh, with Dr. Michal Biton. Um, I want to uh, I want to just take a moment and, and contextualize this conversation um, in the in the midst of this broader series that we are doing at ICAR this uh, this summer. Uh, our featured speaker series um, and with our incredible gratitude to Lisa and Maury Friedman Foundation, um, who sponsored this series, we are focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Are doing. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and so, uh, and this conversation is called Diversity in Our Jewish Community, Spotlight on Spartic Jews uh, with Dr. Michal Biton. Um, and I'm particularly excited about this because I have known uh, Michal now for many years um, from the faculty of the Hartman Institute um, and have been following her work with um, really with great interest because Michal's perspective is one that always leaves me um, both with more questions and feeling like how could I not have seen the world uh, this this way before and even from our conversation the other day in preparation for this conversation Michal I have a whole new perspective and a whole new range of questions that I'm eager to ask you. So um, so let me give you a brief background uh, to Michal, and then I'm, we're going to engage in conversation together. Dr. Biton is a um, scholar in residence at the Hartman Institute of North America and is the Rosh Kihila, which means uh, the head of the community and co-founder of the downtown Minion in New York City. Michal got her BA from Yeshiva University and earned her doctorate from NYU, where she conducted an ethnographic study of a Syrian Jewish community with a focus on developing the field of contemporary Spartic studies in America. Um, she is an alum from the Wexner Graduate Fellowship, um, and she's received all kinds of accolades and, uh, and awards, including her inclusion in the 36 Under 36 in the New York Jewish Week. Um, and she lives in New York, and um, and so we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk for for this hour together about why um, this work of DEI is so critical: diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and and, and Michal, you've written about um, about the instinct to kind of flatten the differences within and between diverse Jewish populations. And it seems to me that as we engage in this conversation, you're absolutely the best person um, for us to talk to, to help us understand what you even mean by that and how, what it means to really create a truly inclusive and just Jewish community. So I welcome you here. I'm so glad that you're with us. Thank you for making the time. And I wonder if we can start by just having you tell us a little bit about your background, about your family, about your story and what you br what brought you into this work in the first place. Uh, sure, and really great to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Browse, it's been so wonderful to learn with you and from you for uh, for all these years. And um, one day I'll be at Ikar in person, but right now it's just good to be here uh, from New York uh, over Zoom. Uh, so I'll start off by just telling you a little bit about uh, myself, my story. Uh, I think that when we talk about diversity, I bring with me two different stories of diversity. One story is uh, as an immigrant who grew up in South America. So I was born in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, uh, and I grew up, my family moved around a little bit, but I grew up um, in, in Argentina, some years uh, in Israel, uh, and then in Montevideo, Uruguay, until I was about 12. Uh, so that's very much part of my, of my identity, just feeling like uh, like an immigrant, like someone who, who heard about America growing up and then came to this country uh, and, and pretty much with pretty strong formative experiences growing up in South America uh, and still very much having the accent, uh, you know, be, be, being seen by others uh, um, as an immigrant having to, to learn English. Uh, and a lot of the ways that I approach my work and my research has been shaped by having to come to a new country and having to really uh, translate a whole new world and a whole new environment uh, and, and make myself understood to it as well. That's also, by the way, why I spell my name with a J. People often ask, you know, Michal, Michal, I don't know if you can see my name here. 
And I say, you know, there was nothing very creative about it. I was just like a very stubborn 12 year old. And when we came to America and I was told to change my name, I said, no way, it's not happening. I'm going to I'm going to keep it the way I grew up with it. And America will have to learn how to say my name, which it really hasn't. But uh, but, you know, but that's that's OK. Uh, I guess the other story that I bring with me to this conversation or the other background um, it really does have to do with being uh, a Sephardic Jew. Uh, so my, my dad's uh, background in terms of his, his families, uh, he is this, the, the grandchild of immigrants to Argentina from Morocco and from Syria. Um, my mom was actually born in Spain in a place called Melilla, which is a Spanish uh, colony in Northern Africa. Uh, and I grew up um, in a very confident and strong Sephardic home. And it was a Sephardic home, and it's important for me to, to tease this out, it was a Sephardic home, not only in terms of like the food that we ate and the songs that we sang, uh, and in terms of the, the, the customs, the minhagim that we followed. I also grew up with a sense that I was part of many different types of Sephardic traditions at the same time. And I'm naming it from the beginning because of what Rabbi Rouse, what you just asked about differences even within differences. Uh, so uh, as an example, um, my great uncle, uh, who passed away uh, a year ago, uh, of Basel Amory, Jose Faur, Jose Faur, was an academic. And, and I felt like with him, I inherited a Maimonidian rationalist Sephardic tradition in which we spoke in my home about like Andalusian Jewry and kind of like what, what we inherited from that. And I grew up with my mom's Sephardic tradition, which was like a Spanish Moroccan, uh, maybe a little bit more mystical uh, tradition. And I grew up with Ravovadia, Ravovadia, who was the former, a um, couple of formers ago, a Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel and one of the most important Sephardic rabbis of the 20th century. My parents would go to his classes when they were dating in Israel. So I grew up with his sort of like pan-ethnic Sephardic approach to Sephardic uh, al um, Sephardic uh, Jewish law. So, so I grew up with this many different strands of Sephardic tradition. Uh, and part of the way that I was raised in my family, my, my dad's a rabbi, my mom's a rabbinite, so they, we were a rabbinic communal home, was as a home that was very proud and confident of our Sephardic uh, heritage, but constantly in conversation with other parts of the Jewish community. So it wasn't, it wasn't separate. Um, it was in conversation with, with different uh, strands. Uh, and going to right now, I would suggest to situate myself, even before I talk about my scholarship, right now, I would say that part of what shapes the way I look at the world and the way I think about questions of diversity is that I continue being part of multiple communities. So I'll just name some of them. I am, um, as when we moved to America, I spent my teenage years in the Persian Mashadi community in Great Neck. My parents are still there serving as rabbi and rabbinit. So that's like very much part of my life. Um, I'm part of like the modern Orthodox community, the, the minyan that I lead, I say, would fall kind of like within that. Uh, I work at a pluralistic and liberal think tank at, at Hartman. Um, and my research and my family by marriage is in the Syrian Sephardi community in Brooklyn. My husband, he's not here right now, but I, he's a good example. My husband, Sian, uh, his parents um, are political refugees from Egypt, uh, whose families came beforehand from Syria and Iraq. Uh, so I have very, very close ties with the Syrian Sephardi uh, community in Brooklyn. So, so I have a little bit of like a, a connection right now that transcends, uh, transcends like immigrant backgrounds and nationalities and ethnicity and, and all kinds of, of traditions that we talk about. Uh, and these questions about diversity, about inclusion are questions that I think about from a scholarly perspective, but also from a very personal perspective, just about my own life and, and the way that I position myself. That's incredible. That's really incredible. I just grew up in New Jersey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Michal, I, you have um, you, you've spoken about a feeling of I think you called it a, a sense of vertigo, living um, at the kind of at the intersection of um, your scholarship and your deep ties to these these um, communities, which clearly has afforded you the opportunity to see things that many many others can't see. And so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about some of the findings um, in your scholarship over the course of the last couple of years. And I know that a lot of this has been heightened in, um, in the Trump era and in the post-Trump era. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're finding that might take us by surprise about what uh, what some who are, um, who are identify as part of the Jewish community, see and hold that might, that might very much, that might be very different from what others who are also part of the Jewish community see and hold. Right, sure. Let me first tell a little bit about my research so you know where I come into these things. Uh, but I'll just say I, I did my PhD, I did it at NYU. Uh, 
and I ended up doing um, a sociological study on the Syrian Sephardi community in Brooklyn. I'm writing my book on, on the community right now. Uh, and I immersed myself for about five, six years. Uh, it was actually when, as I got, it's like personal, right? As I got married to my husband, I started studying his community. So it was a very interesting experience because I entered the community by marriage and I started studying it. And I was really invested in trying to understand um, what has been their American Jewish experience. Part of what I found is that if you look at the scholarship of Sephardic Jews, there's very, very little scholarship of Sephardic Jews. I, I can be a little bit dark sometimes. I say we have a lot of scholarship on like dead Sephardic Jews, but like on Sephardic Jews who are like alive in the US right now, there's like very, very little. Uh, and often when you hear people talk about Sephardic Jews, you often hear people talk about some of what are like the more obvious like ethnic differences like food or music which are really important but i was actually really intrigued in asking the same questions we asked about all american jewish communities like how do you engage with questions of what, about what it means to be an american and about what it means to negotiate a jewish community in an open environment so those were the questions that really intrigued me questions around boundaries and belonging and identity um, and I'm, I'm happy to go back into, you know, more deeply into the findings, but, but in relation to what you just asked, like what might be surprising, I think part of what I have been, and the sense of vertigo, part of what I have been thinking about, struggling with, uh, trying to, you know, to talk about is that, um, let, let me take a step back to try to explain this. Um, part of what I feel is that in a lot of my Ashkenazi spaces, and I'm generalizing, there's you know, also some Sephardi, but mainly Ashkenazi spaces, they tend to be uh, liberal. And I'm talking like politically liberal, but also the way that they approach some questions around morality, which I would put in like a more liberal bucket, like focusing on like the individual and, and, and their choices um, in, a, in a very specific way. Uh, and those are spaces that are the ones who are increasingly talking about diversity. <laughs> and the ones who are talking about like the need to be more inclusive and the need to include people who look differently than them or who come to other places. Um, and then these other spaces that I'm in, like the Syrian community or other places, which represent very often those diverse Jews, but they actually have like a moral language that's like in a totally different place. Um, if, I, if I were to say it in a way that's like very general, but they're often much more politically conservative. And I'm generalizing it. Part of the, the interesting thing about describing a population is describing in broad, broad brush strokes, even while allowing for a lot of people within that to be a little bit different, right? Uh, so, so maybe what's surprising or, or maybe the challenge that I want to put on the table, right, is what happens when you have parts of the Jewish community, and we can also extrapolate from this to like America more broadly, right, who really want to do the work of diversity and inclusion and getting to know other Jews who maybe are in the minority or maybe underrepresented in the scholarship or the communities, but they're actually coming with very different ideas about what it means to, you know, to do good in the world. What kind of political landscape do we need? Even the words that you use at the beginning of the conversation, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or the, you said uh, something about um, being inclusive and being just. These are words that will mean totally different things to different communities and different populations. So that's something that both growing up in multiple communities and living in multiple communities, and also as a, as a, as a sociologist and ethnographer, um, that, that's one of the things that I, that I think about a lot. And I'll, just, I'll say one more thing. Um, part, part of what's underlying what I'm saying here is that when we talk about diversity, right? we have to think about diversity in terms of how different populations and different groups see the world. That it's not only about like, again, not, not that you're doing this, but others might. It's not only saying, okay, this person comes from this country or has this accent or looks this way or it's this food. It might also say, oh, because they had these experiences, they might actually approach the world in a different way in, in the following ways. And, and that actually becomes uh, really challenging, a really challenging question. How do you then engage across difference? Yeah, I, w I really want to understand more about this. And um, so when we started to talk the other day, I was mentioning to you how my daughter goes to a modern Orthodox high school. And when she started, uh, when she started school, um, at the first week of school, she said to friends on the way out, she said, good Shabbos, good Shabbos. And they said, we don't, that's so Ashka normative. We don't say good Shabbos. We say Shabbat Shalom. And it brought this, we were shocked by that. We were shocked. We never heard that before. Like we thought that that was just kind of, a thing Jews said to each other on Friday. Anyway, it kind of brought this sensitivity to us that, that we've been 
you know, growing in sensitivity and, uh, you know, over these years about like, what are the normative assumptions that we all bring into the interactions that we have? And, um, and, and there are all kinds of, um, of Ashkenazi assumptions that, that are, that are kind of built into the framework of many of the established Jewish community spaces. And when I share that with you, Michal, you said you're not even talking about the, the like that soap shot. We're not even talking about the way that we greet each other, the foods that we eat, the, like those things we can make space for in our, in our communities that there are much harder things to make room for, which is when we might fundamentally see the world differently. And how do you create a play, an environment that's truly inclusive and welcoming for people who really see the world in dramatically different ways. So I'm very interested um, in hearing more from you about what you, I think you even indicated that there's a kind of, there's a, there are moral distinctions, um, that the way that we use language, the way that we understand core ideas are different. And you certainly um, saw this play out differently in terms of support for um, Trump or opposition to Trump, because that kind of tends to, that, that, that tended to bring all of these things to a head. So what did you see? I mean, how do you understand um, f for, f how would you explain uh, the, the way that, that, so that, that some Jewish communities, um, where a 70 something percent of American Jews really strongly opposed Trump, uh, Trump as a presidential candidate and as both in both elections, but the, the, of the remaining 30%, there were people who very strongly supported him and really believed in him, maybe 20 to 30%. And I think some of those are in the communities that you're talking about. So can you just help us understand um, what you wish that the conversation about diversity was really paying attention to beyond Good Shabbos versus Shabbat Shalom and beyond the way that we make our haroset? Yeah, sure. But let me just first start by clarifying something. I would have no problem with anyone smiling at me and saying good Shabbos down the street. I think it's lovely. <laughs> and I think that if I say Shabbat Shalom, you can ask me, why are you being so Sephardic? No, whatever you want to say. I, I, I have no problem. Maybe I'm a little bit of a heterodox thinker around some of these microaggression issues. I don't think it's a problem. I think that part of what I love about being part of the Jewish people is that we have different customs and different ways of saying Shabbat Shalom. And I always, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think there's like a sign of, uh, I don't know if it's a sign of, 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 of confidence in my own place in the Jewish community that if you tell me good Shabbos, I'll say Shabbat Shalom. And I know that we both understand what we're saying and that we're both meaning. Um, yeah, so, so, so I think there's interesting questions there around normative assumptions. Are normative assumptions always bad? Can we just say if most of people in a community are one way, can we talk about it a certain way without always being nervous about everything we're saying and making people feel included and excluded? Now, this is not to say that there aren't bad things. I've definitely had experiences uh, I've been rejected from jobs, I know, because I'm Sephardic. Like, I actually, like, have, I took notes after an interview uh, that I knew that it definitely happened because um, I'm Sephardic. You know, back in my dating days within the, the Orthodox community, I know that, like, being Sephardic or Ashkenazi very often affects uh, who agrees to go with you. So I'm not saying that we don't have things to, to think about, uh, but I also think that we have to have some broad understanding about different ways that people express themselves. And I think that it's, you know, able to say like, you know, Yids, how do you say that? Like Yids come over or something like that? Like Jews in Yiddish? And I'm like, oh, that's lovely. Uh, it's it's beautiful and it's part of my Jewish people, even if I would never use that word uh, because I'm probably mispronouncing it. Uh, but, but going back to, to the question, what do I wish, um, what am I thinking about when I'm talking about kind of like diversity done right? So I think, I think the problem the main problem that we have right now is that we're not very honest with ourselves, okay, about trying to understand the differences between different groups uh, and trying to be very honest with ourselves about almost like the cost benefit analysis that happens in terms of including different groups and what that, um, what that requires. Um, let me, but let me take a step back and just clarify some something, make sure that I, that, I, that I make this very clear. One of the tensions that I want to put on the table as I'm, as I'm describing the honesty that I think is needed is that we can talk about like group characteristics and we can talk about like trends in specific groups without arguing that every single person in that group is like that. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Just tell me. Uh, so let me bring myself as an example. Okay. So I'm a, a, I'm a woman. I have a PhD. I lead my own minyan, my own community. I am so different than most of the women in my communities of origin. I am very much an exception to the rule as a woman in the things that I have pursued, 
So I'm somebody who, if you look at me, like I would actually be like on the margins in terms of some of these things. So I want to have a discourse in which I can talk about myself as like an authentic part of my community, right? But I can also say, but when I'm looking at trends and I'm looking at like what's representative in terms of a particular community, I can tell you that I'm more, if you want to call it like traditional way of leading is something that's more common there. Is that, is that clear what I'm trying to put on the table? That we can kind of like have the things at the same time? So I think that part of, part of the challenge right now is that we're not honest with ourselves about the way that groups are very different from each other. And there's a certain um, illusion that we have that we are able to include everybody. That we're just able to say we want to be an inclusive uh, community, an inclusive group, and just open our doors to everybody. And that we're not always, um, we don't always recognize that the project of inclusion itself is a really complicated one. Let me give you like one of the ways I forgot who, I, I wish I could quote who said this to me, but I forgot who shared this metaphor to, with me. Part of the way that I think about this, it's like, it's almost like we're setting up a table and we say we want to invite all different parts of people to sit here, but we don't recognize that the table itself and the way that it's set up, right, will automatically make some people want to come and some people not want to come. One easy example to say this is like just bringing up gender. It's like a very su super easy example. If you think about, and, and we can also talk outside the Jewish community, think about like very uh, devout, socially conservative, like Muslim religious communities, okay? Or think about very devout, socially conservative Sephardi communities who are very similar in terms of their gender roles to, um, to Muslim communities. So imagine you say, you know, I want to have a religious service and I want to be super inclusive and I want to be inclusive of all these communities. But what if they tell you, oh, for me to feel included, for me to be, to feel like I'm able to be there, then, you know, we, we can't have a woman speaking from the BIMA for doing certain things. So I, I want to be clear, I am not advocating right now that we then say to both of us that we shouldn't talk so that we can make another community feel included. What I am advocating for is to actually name this and to struggle with this and to say, that project of inclusivity, uh, it's, it's going to start in, it's going to be intentional with some other values that we have, maybe as moral imperatives, and we're going to figure out who can actually fit here and who doesn't because of the values that we hold. It's kind of impossible to assume that everyone's going to be able uh, to, um, to feel included. Uh, more specifically going to your question, uh, part of what I, what I know and what I sense in the Persian community where I spent my teenage years and where I, I go back to visit monthly in the Syrian community that I'm, I'm part of. Uh, these are communities that uh, are very socially conservative, overwhelmingly voted for Trump. And you can kind of like see where the zip codes and where the votes went. Uh, if I'm in those spaces and I talk about like the fact that I voted for Biden, people are like, you know, they look at you weird. Liberal is like a bad word. Uh, when I speak about the new government in Israel and how excited I am, it's like, how dare you? Um, and, uh, and those are things that characterize these communities. Now, we can, we can try to understand why, right? And I'm happy to go into that and try to give a glimpse into why I think that these communities uh, align this way. Uh, but part of, what I'm, part of what I'm urging us to do is to say, is to, is to take this seriously as a reality and to say, okay, if these are the facts, if, if some communities that come from different places are going to be like in terms of like the, the, the trends are going to have certain moral voices, certain political views, what does it mean when we talk about inclusion? What does it mean when we talk about kind of like including everybody here? Uh, and part of what we're seeing, forget the Jewish community, part of what we're seeing in terms of like American electorate, right? And American politics is that we're seeing that the share of my, like minority votes that have gone uh, to, the, to the Republican Party and to Trump in the last election actually increased. So it's kind of telling us that the myth of certain groups all feeling a certain way or all being aligned with certain parties or that we can talk about people of color as all being like one block, like, you know, like uh, Cubans in Florida and like, you know, uh, Mexicans in Texas, that they're all the same, but those are like just not true, they're illusions. And that we have to kind of take a step back and ask ourselves, who are these different groups? What do, how do they think broadly, right? What are their, their moral views, their politics? And then how do we make the difficult cheshbon, the difficult like moral calculus in terms of the values that we hold, including the value of wanting to be inclusive and wanting to be diverse? That was a bit long, I hope you can. No, it's, it's great, Michal, thank you. It reminds me of, um, I, I participated when I was living in New York before we moved out to Los Angeles in this incredible gathering of um, Orthodox, conservative, and reformed Jews uh, in one of the synagogues in New York. And we were talking together about homelessness. And 
It was absolutely astonishing, totally unprecedented. There were black hat Haredi rabbis there along with, you know, reform rabbis. It was, it was an incredible gathering. And we were actually sitting at the tables together and we were talking. And then at some point uh, in the afternoon, someone said, oh, it's time for Mincha. And so we all got up and walked over to the side of the room to Davin Mincha. And so I'm standing there and I'm waiting and waiting. And I'm like, what's going on? Why, why aren't we starting? And I looked around and realized that I was, I was the only woman that was standing there. Like all the other women knew that you have to leave the room for Mincha. And I, I didn't because I also needed to Davin Mincha. I needed to um, say the afternoon prayers. And I realized that they would not proceed until I left. Now, there were only a couple of men who really felt that way there, but there was this sense among all the men that I should just leave so that they could have this beautiful moment of Klal Yisrael, of, you know, the, the unity of the Jewish people, that they, they could, I was an, ob just by virtue of being a woman who hadn't left the room, I was an obstacle to this incredible, uh, beautiful thing that they were all going to write, you know, tell their grandchildren about. It was so amazing. I remember when a Haredi rabbi would uh, would, would sit and talk to me and then and then Davin Mincha with me. And it was like, I remember I, I afterwards I said it was like, it was worse than being invisible. It, it was worse than invisible because if you're invisible, they don't notice you. Here, I was actually the obstacle to their beautiful moment. And so um, I, I, I really, I hear what you're saying. And so there's, a, there's both a flattening. I want to, let, let me offer that there's a flattening that happens on the side of perhaps in the progressive communities where there are assumptions like Jews of color or people of color all want a certain kind of multiracial, you know, just society. And we, and we need to work to build that on all of our behalf. There's a kind of, and you're saying, well, not everybody wants what you, what, what you want when you say a, a just and equitable multiracial society. But I think there, there might also be a flattening on the other side of this argument, which is imagine a community in which everybody in, in which we're really trying to make space for everybody, including the people who don't make space for everybody else. And would that not also lead to a kind of flattening where, for example, your voice and my voice might not be welcome in that space. Queer voices might not be welcome in that space, et cetera. And so it, isn't there, a, could there not be a flattening that's happening um, on, on both fronts? Uh, yeah, the difference is that they don't pretend to be inclusive. That That's part of what I'm naming here, right? So, so there's uh -huh. a, so I've experienced this, like, I mean, I still do, like, pretty much everywhere. <laughs> I had a Mincha situation this past weekend, whatever. Uh, I experienced this pretty much uh, every day of my uh, of my life. And, and I've also made the choice to continue being in a traditional community. And, you know, that's, that, you know, involves its own moral calculus. Um, but, but there's a clear, and this goes back to questions around morality, there's a clear sense that there is the morality of the group. Like if I if I can quote you like you know like psychology more like a cultural anthropologist like Richard Schweder or others who basically say some societies or some communities have a collectivist way of thinking. So if you're the individual, you come second to the collective, and if this is what's good for the collective or for God, we can talk about that also. Then of course you're going to have to subsume your sense of like personal dignity <laughs> because of what's good for the collective and what they might argue is like the lowest common denominator in terms of making most people uh, feel comfortable. So a hundred percent, I agree with you about that, but they don't, but the language that I hear like on the right, no one's claiming, that's what I said before, the language of diversity and inclusion, it's one that's actually located mostly uh, on, the, on the left. On the right, that's not being claimed as much. So part of the gap in terms of, part of what, at least for me, part of the gap of what I think we need to think about when it comes to diversity, for me, it's a conversation that, that's kind of located on the left because the right like, just, like, doesn't, doesn't talk about this. <laughs> it's not having this conversation uh, around being more, you know, in the same way. Um, and going, just going back to one more thing you said, when you talk about a just society, it's not that they're going to disagree with the need for a just society, is that they would either just have a very different, different definition of justice, or that they would actually have a different values that are in tension with that. And, and, and I am constantly in spaces, both in the right and the left, like we, we, we use language and we almost like assume like everybody agrees with this. And if they don't, then they're like immoral or wrong. And we don't always do the exercise of actually trying to take a step back, right? So I'm all, as an anthropologist, I'm all for spending a lot of time trying to understand. Then you can go to the moral evaluation, right? So it's almost like we skip that step 
we immediately are like, oh, you don't agree, this is an immoral, uh -uh. and we kind of, and I am much more invested, and, and it's very personal, like you heard about my, my biography and like my daily life. <laughs> Part of what I do on like an almost like daily basis is actually step and say, okay, let me try to understand. What are all the ideas and the values that lead you here? What is like the package of morality that sustains you, right? Like the, the, and then we think this try to understand and then I can actually ask myself, do I agree, do I disagree? And then I can ask myself, do I want a partner? Do I want a dialogue and all those other questions? But, it's, but I think we, we kind of skip over that because it's very difficult. It's very difficult to actually have this uh, encounter. Uh, and I think we need, I think we just need to acknowledge much more what we don't know, right? And what we, what we, what we haven't experienced yet. Uh, and the fact that it's important um, to have this conversation. I'll give you one more example. Um, Mizrahi Jews in Israel, okay? Like Mizrahi Jews in Israel are roughly 50% of the Jewish population uh, in Israel. And polls after polls show that like most of them are right-wing. They're like the base of the Likud. They are like, you know, um, and, and I think most of my liberal American Jewish friends have a really difficult time <laughs> knowing anything about Mizrahim. And often they kind of like have this pretty simplistic uh, caricatures. And they also, it's very hard for them to like uh, understand them in a way that like, it's almost like you have like this imaginary, oh, they're minorities, they're people of color, they're whatever. Also, oh, they must be aligned with the left. Also, oh, they must. And part of me is like, no, you have to, you have to like take a step back, put away your categories, understand who they are, right? What are the polls telling us? What's the history telling us? What are the values telling us? And, uh, and, uh, and, and spend time, you don't need to agree with them. Like, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not arguing for agreement or for like moral saying, okay, we, inclusion means we need to just like, you and I can never speak in front of an audience because it offends people, right? That's not what I'm saying, but we need to be honest about um, the obstacles, right? <laughs> and what's really at play. And, and the fact that when you include one group or what, it's never neutral. You're always going to, it, there's never inclusion without exclusion. That's the way that I think about things. You can never, you can never include and everybody. So, so I'm, um, yeah, that's pretty much what I, what I think about. That's very powerful. There's never inclusion without exclusion. That's so part of that, that's what I think. There might be some exceptions to this, but in general, I think that you, the act of including, if you think about a community, a community always has boundaries, no matter if you don't use the word boundaries, like even a community like Ikar, no matter what community we're talking about, it would always have boundaries because you would always have a conception of what makes you a community, right? A we, um, and, and the act of including people will always, would always be would all, you will always be negotiating other mm -hmm. people not being part of that and that's that's okay i think that's the way we build communities and and we have to think about what are the the, the morals and the, and the values that that um underlie um our communities okay so i want to ask you to break it down for us a little bit more because some of what you're saying i'm sure is new to 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 many of the people who are with us today and so first, if, if you can first just explain what, what you mean by certain terms, like what do you mean by Sephardi Jews? What do you mean by, by Mizrahi Jews? And then I want to ask you to help us understand. And I, well, first, let's, let's do first things first to so help us yeah. understand who you're talking about. Great. So I'll do that. And I'll just, uh, I, it's always important for me to be very transparent about the research I bring with me. And I'll just say there's very little research on who Sephardi Jews in America are. So this is like my own definition. Okay. So Michal's definition. Uh, because there's such little research. But uh, I have a very expansive definition of Sephardic. So this, I see the term Sephardic um, in, in the United States context as a pan-ethnic identity. So part of what I'm describing is that you had a lot of communities, like let's say like Syrian Jews or Moroccan Jews or Iranian Jews. And these were Jews that in their communities of origin maybe didn't identify as Sephardic because that wasn't the term that you used. It wasn't like a social term. You were you were a Lepan, you were a Khalabi, right? <laughs> or, or you were Syrian or you were Jewish. Like it wasn't, and if you spoke about Sephardic, it was usually about a Lecha, about Jewish law. But part of what I learned in my research is that the process of immigration to America and being with a majority Ashkenazi community meant that a lot of these populations now are Sephardic. That's the way they begin talking about themselves. So when I say Sephardic, I am talking in a United States context and I'm talking about a lot of different communities. Some of them come from, uh, Spain originally from the Abraham Peninsula, some of them haven't, but they self-identify as Sephardic. Uh, they usually have different rationale, either because of al because of Jewish law, because of Minhad, because of custom. And part of what I explore in my own research is how being in being a minority within an Ashkenazi 
a majority Ashkenazi Jewish minority, um, has shaped the way that many of these communities talk of themselves as Sephardic. Now, I make a clear distinction in my scholarship between the term Sephardic and the term Mizrahi. And let me be clear here that I'm not gatekeeping, so this is not me telling you or people how they could or not identify. Um, I think self-identification to me is the most important question, actually, but I am I'm talking in generalities in terms of, of research categories and classifications. Uh, Mizrahi, and here there is consensus in the scholarship, so I'm quoting other people, but Mizrahi basically, what does Mizrahi mean? Mizrahi means East. Uh, Mizrahi was not a term that existed historically before the immigration of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa into Israel. Uh, the, you know, basically, I'm generalizing so much the history right now, but basically what ends up happening is that you have an Ashkenazi hegemony in Israel that looks at all of these immigrants from, again, from, from Yemen and from Morocco, and they're like, oh, these are all the communities from the East. So they actually flatten all the differences between these groups who didn't used to think of themselves as the same. Uh, and it's also a term that had very like negative connotations, like we are the Westerners, right? If you're the Easterners, we are the Westerners, we are the advanced ones, we are the enlightened ones. Uh, eventually the term gets reappropriated. So today in Israel, you hear the category of Mizrahi and it's, it's a term that people use to self-identify. In Israel, by the way, you still have the category of Sephardic, which is very much alive, especially in the Haredi context, like in Shas, for example. If you listen to them, Shas is a, is a Sephardic uh, political party. Uh, they don't say Mizrahi, they say Sephardic. It's a, it's a more like religious uh, category. But coming back to the American context, uh, I say Sephardic, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the way that a lot of uh, activists and some communal leaders use the word Mizrahi to refer to people like my husband, for example. Like I, I have, I, I actually have a Spanish background, but like my husband who has like no Spanish uh, background, they would say, oh, he's Mizrahi, his family comes from Egypt or Syria. And I'm, uh, I, uh, I oppose that because A, it doesn't align with any of the scholarship that does exist. And also it's not the language that's used in these communities organically. Uh, and one of the things that I shared with Ray Browse before our conversation is how I often hear people who are like, oh, come talk to this like group of Mizrahi students. And then I come and I'll talk to the student and I'll often be like, oh, okay, write in the chat, what are the categories you grew up with at home? And they don't write Mizrahi. They usually say, oh, you know, um, Tehrani and Persian and this and that. But that is shifting a little bit, I think, partially because a lot of people, and I've heard this in classes, they tell me I have to use Mizrahi. It's what they're calling me right now. <laughs> so I think it's like an interesting uh, question about uh, classification uh, uh, and categories and, and how do you understand each other. But just to make one, one more thing clear here. So my definition of Sephardic is very expensive in the US context. So that means that I include in it people who came three, like the first Jews who arrived in America, in colonial America, they were Sephardic Jews. And also Jews who came from Iran, like four or five decades ago, right? So, so I'm giving you an example of how, how this category can include people that, like Ashkenazi similarly, right? That come from different origins and that come at very different times. So, so the population of Sephardic Jews uh, is, you know, uh, my guess is that it's roughly 10% of American Jews. We don't have the best data on it. Uh, Pew said it's 7%, but again, I, uh, I would assume it's a little bit higher, uh, but, but it's a population that itself is diverse uh, in terms of the people that it encompasses, the places they come from and when they came to the US. Can you talk about the intersection now of those categories with uh, what we call Jews of color in the United States now? Yes, and that is a very complicated question. So I'm gonna try to, to break it down. Um, I'll say something, I'll just take a step back. I happen to kind of like fall in all of these classifications, okay? I am I am Sephardic, right? I also come from Middle East and North Africa. So those who want to say Mizrahi, they would, they would use me there. Uh, I'm also non-white Hispanic. So I would fall uh, in, in, in that category um, as well. So I'll answer your question by saying that we actually currently have no research. There is no research that shows the relationship between um, I'm going to use some jargon between like racial and ethnic classification categories that work within the United States and between what we might call more traditional Jewish ethnic categories. Okay, so let me give you an example too. So, so a, a colleague of mine sent me something that they wrote and there they, they actually put in the same sentence like, you know, uh, we have uh, Hispanics and we have Asian Jews and Black Jews and we have Sephardic and Jewish. And I wrote back and I said, these are a little bit like apples and oranges because you, you, I have, um, I have, I have a uh, black friends who are Ashkenazi and I have Sephardic friends who are white. 
uh, and 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 they that's actually like in terms of like the, the the logic of how these categories were constructed there is currently no there's like no rationale that has been given to explain the overlap between them does that make sense what i'm trying to put here so part of the challenge i think is that we are we are very new at at this uh, at this work of trying to make visible all the diverse parts of our community. So we are, it's important to name that we're like at the cusp of it in terms of the research. And that's really important to name because I'm excited for it to continue developing. And, you know, it, it, it takes a while for the, the research field to mature. And we haven't done this work. Part of it is because there is like a tremendous dearth of research in general. And as an expert and like, as one of the very few people who's actually done academic research on, on, um, U.S. Sephardic Jews who are alive right now. Uh, there's just uh, very little research in general, uh, so we, we currently don't have that research. I can tell you that I turned to uh, to some of the folks at Pew and I asked them to tell me what percentage of people who identified as Sephardic and or Mizrahi in their uh, research that was a total of seven percent, by the way, what overlap there was with the eight percent who identified either as non-white uh, or uh, Hispanic or white and something else. Okay. And they told me that they had, uh, there was no, um, there was no overlap actually between the two different categories, at least in the data that they're collected. Um, so, so that tells us something about this actually being distinct groups. Um, but again, we need more research. We, like, I'll give you, an, I'll give you just one example. Syrian Jews, what are they? Okay. Now we might say, well, it might have to do with like country of origin. It might also have to do with immigration. You have Syrian Jews who came here five generations ago and some who came, who escaped from Syria in like the nineties because Syria was closed off. Uh, Jews were pretty much virtual prisoners there until 1992. Um, so, so there's a question there. And it's a question that we can ask about like US census categories. Right now there's five racial and ethnic classifications in the US census and people from the Middle East and North Africa don't actually have their own category. So, so I, I'm basically trying to explain like all these things are very, very messy. And we are trying to figure out both like, like categories from like the US environment, which themselves uh, can be problematized and are themselves imperfect. And we're trying to figure out like, you know, Jews, where do they fall in this? Even like white Jews. And then we're trying to figure out, we also have this like traditional uh, ethnic categories um, and it's a little bit of a mess. So I would say that for those you know, I wrote a piece that I didn't publish, but I was trying to understand how different Jews of color understand the definition of Jews of color. There's actually a machloket there, right? A, a debate in how you understand the definition. And you have some voices that say, it's anybody on the margins, right? Anybody who doesn't, who doesn't fit in with like the, what they might call like the Ashkenormative and like, uh, you know, majority white uh, uh, Jewish establishment. And if that's your definition, then you would put all people there. Now, I, I am myself, uh, I disagree with that definition because I think, like I said earlier, to me, self-definition is really important. And I want to actually do the work to try to understand how these communities think about themselves. What are the categories they're using and how can we honor the different ways that people kind of like express when they're talking about their diverse Jewish experiences? Right. And there are a lot of Ashkenazi Jews who don't identify, who even are in what are white skinned Ashkenazi Jews who don't identify as white. And so that, that yeah, I think I that say, further complicates it. I would say, and again, I'm giving very rough numbers, but depending on what study you look at and some of the estimates you look at, you can argue that like, like a high, up to 30 or more percent of those who are often like put into the category of, uh, of Jews of color. Again, it all really depends on which one you're looking at. So, but, but a very significant percentage identify as other right? Like you cross off other in your, in, in your survey. And, and often, um, and this is anecdotal, I don't have the actual research in this, but so many people who present as white, right? They say, I, I, I choose other when I'm talking about my racial identity. So we actually have like, there's a lot of questions, a lot of research needed to try to, I think it's exciting, right? To try to, um, to understand some of these definitions and diversity and, and all of that. But, but, but to me, again, the, the values that I'm bringing with me, or at least the principles or commitments, number one is a commitment to self-identification and to doing the research to understand how populations themselves talk about themselves, right? That's really important. And I'm also really interested in like rigorous debate and rigorous research. Mm -hmm. And I'll say one more thing here, if I can, sorry, I'm going a little bit long, uh, my answer to your question. Um, I think we have a little problem sometimes, which is that we, um, and it relates to what we spoke about earlier, that we, we have like an intersection in terms of how we, how we look at the world and our values. So what do, I, so I'll give an example. I, I had a funny exchange on Facebook with someone when Pew came out 
And they were like, I can't believe only 7% of American Jews are Sephardic from Israel or whatever. And I was like, oh, it's probably like a little bit higher. But he was like angry. And he's an Ashkenazi uh, friend of mine. And he's like, no, it has to be higher because we're so Ashkenormative. And like, if you want to be inclusive, so it has to be. And, and I said, like, you know, I, I really want you to include me, like, no matter what the percentage is, like, even if it's like 1%, I don't want your values of like inclusivity and inclusion to like be fully based on this number. I understand that we can talk about representation and numbers are important there, but there was something very interesting there, like hearing him, um, hearing him be upset as though he couldn't like carry out this moral project if he didn't have um, a high enough percentage. And I wanted to say, like, I think that that's complicated, and there's some pitfalls there when we when we base our diversity project merely on on numbers. Like, I want there to be like certain moral commitments that transcend, you know, the percentage point that represents me. I really understand that, and at the same time, I think it was very shocking for many American Jews to to who are in these Ashkenazi environments to learn uh, a couple of years ago that the, I mean, the numbers that we heard was something between 12 and 20% of American Jews were Jews of color. And I think that whether, uh, you know, whether that number is one that, that you agree with or disagree with, it shook the um, institutional, it, it shook the institutions to say, wait a minute, there's that many Jews of color who are not represented in our Jewish community, communal spaces, let alone on our boards, let alone in our executive leadership, that something really must be done. In other words, the enormity of that number did awaken uh, the Jewish community, I think, to some extent, to, to ask questions about um, who, who is invited to the table, if not the question of who's setting the table and for whom are they setting it? And what kind of table? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. The, the things I would say, uh, you see, like, I'm going to be a little bit like, I don't know if it's annoying or whatever. I wouldn't say Ashkenormative and then Jews of color, because then you are, you're kind of equating being white with being Ashkenazi. So uh -huh. I'm just saying, like, there's, like, distinctions there, actually. Both, like, you asked me for what's the relationship between different populations. Um, and this, I would say, like, there's different populations that need to be included, and we need to be kind of, like, uh, uh, cognizant of the words that we, that we use for them. Uh, and you know the recent Pew study, uh, it, it pointed to um, to eight percent of, of American Jewish adults who are either not white or who are Hispanic. And Hispanic Jews can be uh, can be white as well. Uh, but I'll tell you just one thing. This a couple of days ago, I had this conversation with uh, with, uh, with with somebody who works in college campuses, and and it was funny because I was thinking about our conversation tonight, and he told me. Uh, you know, Michal, they're doing uh, so many like diversity projects uh, for Jews of color. And as a Sephardic Jew, I just don't know where I fit in there. And I, I'm, I'm confused and I don't always feel comfortable in some of the spaces. And I'm trying to figure out what I, you know, what I can do for Sephardic students. And he said something and I, I was like, I didn't even like give this to him to say to me. He said like, you know, what about like more conservative, you know, uh, Sephardic Jews or this or that. And how can we, uh, how can we make sure that we expand our notions of like this diversity projects to actually understand different underrepresented populations, like you said before, different people who didn't have access to the table or, or weren't included or weren't invited, that we understand the differences between them. And if we decide that we're going <laughs> to invite all of them to the table, that we kind of figure out what do they need? What do we need to do to kind of like uh, include them? It's so interesting. I, I remember Sean Landris uh, like 18 years ago, we were invited to some conversation um, it, it, at the Federation and Sean said, before we can address any of these questions, look at this room. Who is not in this room? Who needs to be in this conversation? And Sean, you were like, you know, 16 years ahead of your time at least. Um, and, and so, I, Michal, I wanna go back to the values for a minute and we're, we, we have about 10 minutes left. So, and I, and I'm, I also wanna invite folks, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll try to get to them or you can write to me directly if you want it to be more, a little more anonymous. I want to ask you b back to something that you started to talk about earlier. So in, in one of your articles recently in the JTA that you shared with me, you wrote the following. You said, this summer, I participated in several private roundtables focused on questions of representation in which diverse Jews were described as fully aligned with progressive ideologies. This is demonstrably untrue. While liberals in my newsfeed were arguing this summer that the best way to honor Jews of color would be to march with Black Lives Matter on the streets, Many of my Hispanic friends were anxious about BLM's anti-capitalist discourse, and my Middle Eastern Jewish friends were more likely to be dropping off cookies at the police precincts than supporting anti-racist demonstrations. Okay, can you please help us understand 
why our different communities feel the way that we do. How does it, how is it possible as an anthropologist, how is it that, that, uh, uh, that certain communities are more likely to drop off cookies and certain communities are more likely to take to the street. What is it about our unique, um, our, our histories, our cultures, about the way that we interpret Judaism that leads us to, with the same Torah, such profoundly uh, different responses to world events? Yeah, um, I, 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 that's a really good question. I think the question uh, needs to be, like part of the way that I approach this question is like in an expanded way, just about Americans, right? How could it be that how many voted for Trump? 74 million or so uh, Americans voted for Trump in the last election. Uh, and I'll say, and again, this, I don't know if everybody agrees with me. Part of my starting point is to try to understand, and I don't presume that all 74 million <laughs> Uh, voted for Trump for the same reasons. And I don't presume that we can kind of like have like a one clear, uh, like I, I, I don't think of all Trump voters as white national. Like I, I don't think of all of them in the same way. I think that there, there's actually differences and different motivations and different ways of understanding different packets of communities that, uh, that voted for Trump. Uh, but, but when it comes to the communities that I wrote about, I mean, um, it's, Okay, I'll tell you, I think that we have a bit of like a blind spot in, in understanding like the immigrant experience a little bit. Uh, there's like a lot of, there, there's like interesting ways to think about the places that people come from and how they, that shapes their politics. So I have a lot of friends who like left Venezuela or left Cuba <laughs> and, and they don't talk, they hear the word socialism. And for them, it's not like this abstract ideal, right? For them, it's like, that's the countries we escape from. And, and they look at like Latin America and like the history of, oh, oh, you know what, my Russian speaking friends, Russian speaking Jews, but we talk about representation, Russian speaking Jews are like super underrepresented uh, in terms of leadership of the Jewish community and the numbers that they are here. Like we have like all this blind spot about those that we, the Jews who are different than us that we know and that we don't know, right? And many of them, when they talk about like, you know, the, the former Soviet Union and they hear, I'm not saying that it, I'm not agreeing that, that what they hear is the reality, okay? So, so just being careful here. But they hear certain parties described as like socialists. They hear certain words, they hear even the word equity as opposed to equality of opportunity, equity of outcomes. And for them, it's like, I have seen this, I have this history, this is not good. There's also really interesting research about like certain people like preferring more like forms of government where there's like, um, I forgot the like academic word, but like more like, almost like more authoritarian forms of government. They might even feel more comfortable. Uh, uh, with that. Uh, also, a lot of these communities um, definitely were shaped in terms of like Israel and Zionism. Like I said, when I think about like Syrian Jews or Egyptian Jews uh, and the like, um, many of them are political refugees who suffered terribly because they were accused of being a Zionist uh, <laughs> uh, spies or sympathizers uh, back in the Middle East. And they have they, 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 they have very strong ties to Israel. They're very Zionistic, they're very right-wing uh, in, in that way. So they very much associate with that. A, a lot of this, by the way, I didn't go into this in the piece, but a lot of this also has to do with like economics. And if a lot of your community's wealth is concentrated like in the real estate industry or in certain like retail <laughs> uh, industries, um, it, it, shapes the, uh, it shapes the way that you think about the tax code and like who you wanna vote for, who you think it's gonna help your communities. Um, so, so all these things, to me are, are, are part of this conversation. Um, and I'll say one, one more thing Yeah, I think that liberal American Jews are, and I'm generalizing right now, but they, they tend to have a fairly high, relatively socioeconomic standing. And they also tend to have a fairly high standing in terms of higher education. Part of what we're seeing right now in terms of research about politics in America broadly, is that some of the polarization that happens has to do with levels of education. So, so part of what I'm saying right now is that we have to examine not only the politics of these communities, but we also have to like examine like our politics. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to look at, as a sociologist, I don't want to look at liberal American Jews and say, this is the norm, this is what should be. And then let me study why everybody else doesn't do this. I actually want to understand each communities and like, what are the different factors that have shaped them to, to look as, to, to, to think about the world in a certain way, to think about America in a certain way, to vote a certain way. Again, I'm putting morality aside for a second. I'm only talking about understanding. Uh, I can explain, you know, I, I very proudly and confidently voted for Biden, even though I got some pushback from like family members who weren't so thrilled that I posted about this on Facebook. It's a different world, right? Um, but um, that doesn't mean that I cannot also understand 
and try to understand why people might have different views uh, to mine. It doesn't mean that I would give like, you know, that there's a distinction between understanding, between giving moral legitimacy, between saying I'm against racism versus saying I'm against all 74 million Trump voters. I think they're all the same. So I, I believe that it's important to make those distinctions, both as a scholar and also we spoke about values as someone who thinks a lot about pluralism and what it means to a society that, that does have different voices. I, I really appreciate that. And there's so much, I, I wish that you were here at Icar and we had you for the whole weekend because we ha we really have to go so much deeper um, into some of this. Uh, the uh, We're almost up to our hour. I, I want to just ask you uh, of the many, many questions I have um, still for you. It, if it is, po I mean, first of all, let me say that hearing you speak really makes me understand why there were four elections in the last two years in Israel with no definitive results. Because, I mean, to, to try to create some kind of cohes some kind of cohesion, cultural, political, social cohesion in a country that's made up, that really is so divided. Um, in, it, it is, it is, it is clearly, it seems extremely difficult, if not impossible to do so, right? So whether we're talking about the state of Israel or the broader, um, the broader conversation of the Jewish community, what could Klal Yisrael actually look like when there are fundamental differences, like the differences that we're talking about? So either what is the best that we could hope um, for in the in the polity of the state of Israel, or what is the best we could hope for for Klal Yisrael, where we're not undermining these differences, we're actually uh, acknowledging them and even affirming them, but also recognizing uh, recognizing that these fault lines are incredibly painful and really hard for people whose whose identities are swallowed up by or undermined by other people's self understanding. So how can we create a collective um, that actually affirms everybody? Is such a thing even possible? Right. It's such an easy question, you know, to end with. Um, I'm joking. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was chatting with a colleague earlier today, actually. And part of what I was discussing with, with her is, like I said, do we, have, do we have a Jewish people? Do we have Jewish peoples? What do we lose and what do we gain when we say and insist that we're Jewish people versus when we say or insist that we are Jewish peoples? You know, so what I'm saying there? Like, I, I think that sometimes, um, I think sometimes we use the language of Jewish people who are called Israel in a way that can actually be harmful because we don't recognize differences and, and the lack of recognition means that we don't have the right tools to do whatever work it is that we wanna, that we wanna, that we wanna do, right? Uh, uh, and sometimes we make too much of our differences, right? And, and we, uh, we otherize each other and make each other foreign in a way that doesn't allow for, for a common space. So yeah, I think that's a really difficult question. I think it's kind of the question of the hour. Uh, I would say that I am, I am moved right now, even, even as someone who believes very deeply in pluralism, I think that we need to do a better job of talking about Jewish peoples. Uh, because I, I, at least in the circles like that I'm in, I think that we need to do a better job of, of actually recognizing like, I might say Jewish and you might say Jewish. We might mean different things. And maybe our discourse would be a little bit better if we understood that. And if we actually said like, that's what you mean, this is what I mean. Some things are gonna be reconcilable. Maybe we won't be able to dab and mincha together or something else to pray together. <laughs> um, some things are gonna be irreconcilable. Some things maybe won't be, we'll fight together against those who wanna harm us or something, right? Um, and by the way, some differences, you might not even have that uh, in common with each other. Uh, but I do think I do think that right right now, and maybe in a couple of months, whatever happens in the air, I'll change my mind. But right now in the pendulum swing, in terms of like emphasizing one over the other, I think that we need to go back to talking about like Jewish peoples, uh, not in a way that is like, that is, that is, that is like offensive or like, you know, but actually saying like we, Judaism, the word Jewish comes before like community, right? And we have multiple communities and we have multiple Judaisms then. Uh, and I, I suspect, and again, I'm, I'm being a little bit equivocal right now in, in what I'm answering because it's a, it's a work in progress in terms of my thinking. I suspect that there could be some really useful uh, things that can come out if we can actually talk about Jewish communities. And if we can, you talk about your values and I talk about my values, 
and we try to really understand each other in a deep way. And we acknowledge that some bridges we'll be able to cross and we try to find places where we can be there for each other. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of where my mind is going to uh, lately. Um, but like you said, it's a, it's a very live conversation that has um, ramifications in Israel, in the US communities and, and in history and in different ways that Jewish communities uh, develop across, um, across time. So, so I both think Jewish people is really important. And I also think that we have to be, that, that, that it could, uh, obscure, what's the right word, like obscure, like hide uh, certain, certain things that don't allow us then to do some of the work that I think uh, can be really, really important. Well, this is incredibly illuminating. I also, I'll just say, I will be, I, I for, for many years now have been thinking more about peoples than people because of some of what you're sharing here today. But I will be very just saddened if if the only thing that really we Jews can unify around is is fighting against uh, those who hate us and want to kill us. I mean, that that would be we very don't have that anymore. By the way, what? And we not, don't even have that anymore. It's like not necessarily that anymore, right? So I mean, I, I I find myself on the side of hoping that there's something thicker in the connection between us and the bonds between us than than simply that. And also, I think what you're, what you're adding many layers of understanding here for us. Um, and Michal, I really hope that this is just the beginning for us, uh, for, your, for your relationship with our community. Um, this is incredibly rich and, and meaningful for me and I think for all of us, and we're deeply grateful. And I really hope that, that you continue to be blessed in your scholarship um, because this, your voice is in, incredibly important here and, and, and really helping to illuminate some very difficult issues for us. So I thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, thank you for having me. Take care. Okay. We're going to go off Facebook now. So if anyone, let's see if we can leave. There we go. Um, thank you, Michal. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I wonder, I just, if we can take an extra, just, just maybe five minutes even here, just for these folks um, who are here on the Zoom, I, I know that Sean put a good question into the chat that I, that I, I was trying to allude to, but wanted to give you a second to ask, but maybe we can just have a moment together before we jump off. Yeah. So what about uh, diversity in terms of historical Jewish interpretation? Oh, that's a really big question, Sean. So, so, um, yeah, do you want to do you want to it up? Also, by the yeah, way, no. I'm very ambivalent about the term Ashkenazi normative. Right. Just, maybe I'm a heterodox thinker. Like, I think it makes sense if if everybody like I am Sephardi normative in my communities. Um, right. And what does it mean? What is it? I mean, there are different traditions of interpretation. We arrive. We use different modes and methods to think about. Um, how, what is the good, how we arrive at those decisions. There's, there are traditions and there are European legal traditions. There are, there are Egyptian, Syrian, Iranian, right? Those different legal traditions, how might we be enriched by understanding the, um, those different traditions? It's not a Jewish question, but um, I still remember uh, in graduate school studying um, Shia is Shiite Islam's approach to gender and marriage, which opens up a whole, I mean, there is a there is an openness to transgender identity mm -hmm. in Shia Islam that simply doesn't exist in Sunni Islam. Right. So what those kinds of questions, what if we start you, you know, what opportunities do we have to to leverage diverse Jewish uh, intellectual traditions? Yeah. So I'll say some disparate thoughts. Um, one is we definitely need more like translated scholarship on like, uh, you know, Sephardic legal jurisprudence, you know, mean uh, all those kind of things. We don't have enough of it. Um, definitely. There's much more in Hebrew, of course. Um, I'll say a, a couple of things. One is that, and I'm not answering your question directly. It's a very big question. One is that even as we do this, I want to urge us to stay away from like mythical um, construction. So I'll give you an example. In certain circles of like, I'm going to generalize for a second, okay? In certain circles of like more liberal Sephardic uh, friends, they do exist, uh, but they'll often talk about like the tolerant tradition of Sephardic Jews uh, legally. Uh, and I always laugh and I'm like, 
come on, we had a tolerant tradition. We also had like Syrian rabbis who burned Elijah Ben Amozeg's books in Aleppo. And in the same, like we, we had, we had tolerance and we had intolerance, we had, we had not. So, so, so one thing that I would say is that even as we learned about these things, again, I'm kind of like warning against like the flattening of like, just saying like, you know, cause I hear that a lot. I'm like, oh, the, the tolerance of, I'm like, we, we had everything. Let's be honest about that. Um, and the other thing, and, and, and then, yeah, I think that there's really interesting uh, questions there. And part of what intrigues me is always how we study about others in a way that kind of like makes new things obvious about ourselves that we weren't so familiar with that before. I'll tell you one thing that I think a lot about. Um, so I, I, I've done a lot of readings and research on the whole idea of traditionalism, Masot Diyut. So traditionalism, and I'm using here in a very specific way, we, in America, in American Jewish communities, we talk about denominations, right? Or I don't even know if it carries denomination, but most, a lot of Jews identify vis-a-vis -vis denominations, which is an Ashkenazi construct that actually has a very European and American uh, history. Uh, the alternative to it, at least in the scholarship, is Masotiut, traditionalism. Right, and there's really interesting research in in, in Israel, uh, and I've I've taken that research and I've made it my own and I applied it to the Syrian community in the U.S. About uh, and what's really interesting there is that you have to kind of put aside what you know about like denominations, and you have like a totally different way of like approaching Jewish practice, and one of the things that I find fascinating actually goes back to the question of normativity, because what you find in traditionalism is and I'm going to try to explain this. So you don't have like a pluralism, you, you, you I'm, I'm not gonna say like in the most elegant way. You basically say, okay, this is the way things are. This is the law. These are the customs. We're not gonna change your discourse, okay? But come as you are, we'll be inclusive. We'll be, we won't change the rules here. We won't change the language here, right? But, but we're not gonna do a litmus test to figure out if you're allowed to enter our space. You'll be welcomed in as long as you're not doing anything outwardly that's like affecting us right in, in, a, in a very significant way you'll be welcomed in um th th does that make sense what i'm trying to 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 communicate here i actually think of it as like a version of the chabad model chabad is not pluralistic it does not pretend to be but it's very inclusive it tells you come as you are we're not going to do a litmus test well you'll come here you'll feel included and it's a totally different way of like organizing and it's a very different way to think about inclusivity because what you see that happens and either you can talk about denominations, you can talk about like progressive spaces, you see a version of communal inclusivity in which you only feel included when you see yourself represented in like the norms of the space. So to me, that's really fascinating. It's saying there's actually like a whole way of thinking about community. There's a whole way of thinking about belonging. And part of what I'm interested in is to figure out, like I, I always like to do like a cost benefit analysis, <laughs> at least from my own value perspective, like what do you gain and what do you lose in like different communal organizations uh, and ways of thinking about Jewish law and like even the expectation of deviance. You have an expectation of deviance in traditionalism by, by which it means you expect that most people are not going to keep alakha, <laughs> Jewish law, but you're not going to change Jewish law because most people are not going to keep it. You're going to kind of like keep it there and just like be okay with that gap. So I don't know if this is answering your question 100%. Sorry if I'm going far afield, but those are the things that come to mind when you ask like what are different things we can learn from a more expansive understanding. Michal, you... Yeah, I think, I mean, I was just going to say, uh, yes, I think you did answer it. What comes to mind as you're talking about two things personally is um, the, the, the difference, for example, between Hungarian Jewry and Polish Jewry, if we're thinking about it in a European context. Um, and historically in the United States, the emergence of the Landsmannschaften when immigrants came to the U.S. from the Pale of Settlement and from Poland and from Hungary and from other places, and some of the very early synagogues, yeah. I, I mean, you know all of this, were, were in fact place-based. They were the Krakower synagogue or the Warszawa synagogue or the, you know, Little Shtetl on the River synagogue, and it was only later that they started to uh, create bonds that are ideological rather than yes. traditional, to use your you know, That's what I'm writing about, basically. Yeah, yeah, so what which have, is fantastic. What, I have, what I'm fascinated by is like the Syrian Jews that I've studied, and Persian Jews are very different because they came much later, so I can't ask the same questions. They haven't been in America for so long, uh, or Bukharian or whatever, or maybe Moroccan. Syrian Jews came late um, 1900s, um, 1800, sorry. Uh, but you have fifth generation Syrian Americans who can tell you like, I am part Shami and Khalabi, like there's like a very strong sense of like local, a relationship with with like a city in Syria that their great great grandparents came from, um, 
So that, that I think is really interesting. And the question of ideology, how much do you, I'll say one more thing, sorry, I know Sharon has something to say. Um, it's, I think it's also a question about, part of what I'm theorizing right now, and it's a work in progress, even the fact of like writing things down, okay? There's much less things written down in some of these communities, much more mimetic. And there's something very interesting there about that also. Like I, I just submitted an article about um, how Syrian Jews have what I describe as like a history resistance. They don't like to be written about. They haven't written much. And I argue it's because you write something down, you're writing it for an audience and you're inviting people from outside your group in. And there's something very, I'm gonna use liberal, not politically, but liberal in terms of like the enlightenment. Sorry, I'm getting very, I can do this all day long, I shouldn't. But you can, you can talk about like the enlightenment project of wanting to use a language that's universal and that's accessible to all. And I, I'm, I'm basically building up a theory of them being non-liberal as actually having all these strategies in which you try as much as possible to keep to yourself. Because like, you don't, you, you're not writing for an audience out there. Like, you don't want that. So you, uh, and, and you can have, um, yeah, sorry, I can, I can go in many places. Uh, Sharon, there are many go. parallels in, Amer in the study of American Christianity. I won't go into detail, but it's a conversation we should have offline about yeah. studying those kinds of communities because it, it is a tension. And we've seen it historically many times. And it's a powerful one and it has a function. And I think it really matters. Yeah. I actually have to jump off and I'm sure others do as well. But this is, I love being a fly on the wall for this conversation between the two of you. Michal, thank you so, so much. Really appreciate you and hope that we'll get to continue soon. Thanks everybody.